Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 54. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, the Cube host. We extract the signal from the noise every week. This is our podcast. We break down what we're working on, what we're seeing, what we're doing. Obviously, we're kicking off event season. We just came back from um, an amazing week at Google Next 24. Dave was had some real proprietary NDA meetings with some of the big players in the industry um, uh, around, the, around the country. And of course, we're digging into all the research on SiliconANGLE. Rob Hope and the team there are doing a great job. And the Cube Research continues to put out great content. Dave, great to see you. Hey, we're, John. Kicking, we're kicking everything off. Uh, again, the season starts, but uh, what a week. You can you can hear in my voice, I'm a little bit uh, you know, tired from, from just really kind of cranking hard at Google Next. I we did like 40 interviews. We have over, over almost 50 interviews and over 500 you know, videos we produced. I think SiliconANGLE has over 30 articles posted and more coming. Just a, a barrage of content. I did a, uh, a segment on the New York Stock Exchange. We did a, a live remote. Just Google Cloud kicked ass. We're going to dig into that. Um, Andy Jassy was on CNBC. You saw the uh, uh, interview. I could not get it because it's on the pro login. Uh, I did see a clip from Brad Gerster from one, uh, Altimeter Capital had a post um, around his really, you know, strong posture against the regulation. And he used iRobot as an example. I know you want you you want to talk about. It. I do too. But you watched it, so I know we have thoughts on that. So yeah. that's we make sure make sure we hit that hard. Um, Intel had an event and, and basically all the analysts blew off Intel and they came to Google next. So you saw a lot of people either not go to Intel's event or just snuck out the back door. Okay. Did an Irish exit, as we say. Um, and so <laughs> Intel's got challenges there and they continue to try to polish up their, um, position, which is in a, in not good. Um, T TSMC, I think outplayed them again. Uh, this 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 week with their funding from the government, Intel got their subsidy, um, and uh, but and TMC is investing as more. Um, so we'll see we'll see what Gaudi does. Gaudi three is a seven nanometer, Davis. It's starting it's starting out behind, and I want to get into this because I did some research on this. Okay, talked to a lot of experts on this. Gaudi three might not make it. Okay, it might be a little too. Late, late, little too late, and a dollar short, or in this case, nanometer short, too big. We're going to get into the energy aspect of it, and also, people are smoking, smoking. You know what? When they get the benchmarks, I had a great conversation at Google Next around how people are sandbagging the performance numbers with the new tokens. So in, in AI, it's all about how many tokens per second can you do. Well, guess what? There's now controversy brewing around tokens per second because you can juice the tokens number with more energy. So we're going to get into that. Cybersecurity uh, consolidation, big blowback from our segment last week where you introduced the paper with Microsoft. That's interesting. And just a lot of news from Google Next that surprised me. And we'll get into that. But it's just, it's just an unbelievable week. And, and I, uh, the whole team is, is cranking. I mean, the, the Google stories is off the charts. Maybe there's more than 30. Um, but you see, you're seeing that enhancements. And, and a surprise note, and I knew I knew it was around that time, but I, it was actually a, a, an event at, in Vegas with Google Next. This is the 10-year anniversary on June 6th where Kubernetes was launched. First commit was June 6th. So unbelievable. Time flies, Dave. Remember, remember when we were sitting there saying, hey, we're going to make a bet on Kubernetes. This is going to be big. This is going to be the glue that or unifies the industry. We don't want another open staff. We want to see something. And we made a bet. We went to every single KubeCon. We invested our own money into the community and got to meet those people that were starting it. And there was some, there was stop, there was some stop starts and risk almost didn't make it. Those people are now running senior positions in the industry and and Kubernetes has been such a big success all around. I will get and into you that and you and Stu were there, right? I think I yeah. think you were there with Stu. Weren't you there when when Kubernetes was announced yeah. at like DockerCon? Stu Miniman and I he and that Red Hat former Cube host everyone knows Stu. Stu and I were having beers with Lou Tucker and JJ who runs OSS venture capital firm and the guy other guy from Kismatic. I forgot his name. And it was talking about the Google paper and spitting that out. And even before that, our first ever Google event, the, when the app engine was around with Craig McLucky, Brendan Burns, and Tim Hawken, and all the Google people were like the nerds working on this. I ended up going to their after hour party and we're all sitting there drinking. They didn't know I was with Silicon Angle or the Cube at the time. And I was just sitting there, they thought I was a Googler. I fit in. <laughs> and they were riffing about how Eric Schmidt was killing the, the, the whole initiative. 
and that they did not want Kubernetes to be another MapReduce. If you remember the MapReduce paper, Dave, they took that out and made Cloudera. They're yeah. like, we, we do not want to see the same thing happen to Kubernetes. We don't want some company to hijack it and then make a business out of it, which Cloudera did, which that was a smart move, by the way, by Cloudera, because Google just gave it to them. So it almost got killed. Kubernetes was almost killed before it even started. So great little legacy in story, but interesting. 10 year anniversary, they had a big party, big cake. Um, really, really cool to see you know, all the. I, I would say I'd go so far as to say that if if Google didn't open source Kubernetes and give that gift to the world, it would have been completely irrelevant in the cloud. Uh, it it's you know we all know it's a distant third, but you know we'll talk about this. But you know they're, they're, the AI is changing the game, and so they're they're new game, new rules. Well, so, well, without next... Kubernetes, what, what what Google would have been just completely irrelevant. Well, the entire cloud native industry might not have been relevant because right. what it, yeah. it, it basically creates the enablement for things like more con container usage, serverless. Kubernetes is a really important technology that has made cloud native really work at cloud scale. So you saw that really, really, uh, really, really prominent at Google Next. Um, it was really interesting to see that, but all good. I don't want to get too fast into Google, but I want to just make sure I hit all my all our topics for this this podcast. Um, yeah, the Intel TSMC investment was big. The Andy, well, Andy, we want to start with the Andy Jassy uh, well, interview. Yeah. Let me just make with? a you no. Know, let me make a quick comment on TSMC. So yeah, they let's start with, let's they start got there first. They got their subsidy, but the to me, the big thing, you know, watching some of the vision stuff, you talk about Gaudi. They were comparing Gaudi performance to, you know, last generation Nvidia chips. Even in look, even Nvidia does some bench marketing. You know, if you if you read. <laughs> If we read the semi-analysis they just did, which was outstanding on um, on Blackwell, you know, even they're playing games. But here's the thing: IDC just put out a report. PC uh, volume is going to grow 1.5 percent this year. Okay, Intel, Intel's monopoly is from PCs. PCs peaked and volumes peaked in 2011. They're now back to pre-pandemic highs. Only going to grow 1.5 percent. Why is that important? That means for Foundry to succeed. They're not going to get volume from their own x86 PC business. The only way they're going to get volume is if they steal major share from TSM and Samsung. So I think the probability that they're going to steal major share, enough share to drive volume, to drive their cost down, to get their yields up, it's a very, very high bar for Intel. And I think it's a, a relatively low probability that they're going to surpass Samsung and get to a, a, a confident number two by the end of the decade, which is their goal. Well, what do you think about the seven nanometer um, announcement? I mean, Gaudi is is you know um, starting out like a leg behind. It's almost like playing with one leg, right? So, so you know, it's like, um, it's like compared to five nanometer and three nanometer, and and their and their benchmarks were comparing as you, as you pointed out, old Nvidia benchmarks. So the not yet even released Intel chip is already claiming that it's better than a multi-year-old NVIDIA chip, which when the new chip comes out will be completely different uh, from a both nanometer perspective, energy management perspective, just overall, everything's different. So is 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 it okay to have a seven nanometer chip? Who cares? I, 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 I think what I've, and this is not, I mean, I, I can't, I'm not an expert on this, but I have been told by people who are that it's hard to compare, you know, Intel's, you know, process, at seven with others at five or three, that there, there are significant differences. I think Intel is trying to leapfrog, play what Floyer calls is, you know, parlor tricks to try to catch up, um, you know, five five nodes in four years. Um, I, I So I, I think I'll give them a pass on that. But again, it just comes down to volume. Uh, how does Intel get volume? The monopoly is basically gone. The monopoly, yeah. monopoly is gone. They no longer have a monopoly. You know, who has a monopoly is NVIDIA. We can talk about that. But then I, I just think, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think if the, your objective, if Gina Ramondi's objective is U.S. Uh, uh, access to onshore uh, advanced chips, the higher probability is to invest more in those that actually are delivering those advanced chips, i.e. Samsung and TSM, TSM in particular, but both of those companies are investing in the United States. 
And so they're, I feel like they're watering down the investments, our tax dollars, a little bit too thinly. I, I want to see Intel succeed. Don't get me wrong. It pains me to say this. But I, the question is, is it more important to have US a U.S.-based supply or is it more important to have a U.S.-based manufacturer? And that, that's not necessarily an easy question to answer, yeah, yeah. but I would say the former is probably more important than the latter. Well, Intel has always been secret. Recently, Intel is very secretive. They're like, everything's scripted. That's a red flag as far as I'm concerned. So I'm very skeptical on Intel right now. I don't have a good vibe on them. I see them you know, groping for relevance, obviously getting um, lapped around the field by the competition. And the TSMC... Um, Arizona win, not only on the grants from the U.S. government and but their own investment, they're winning. And whoever gets on their plate ends up probably having the best chips. Because everyone's designing custom silicon. We saw the ARM Google announcement. So I think TSMC is continuing to kick ass, and and that's not good news for Intel. But you know, since you brought up Intel and, and the policy side of it, the, the government subsidies or the government handouts, what what should we call it? Government funding. What, what is yeah, it? I mean, the chips. What, what, the are they, chips what are they? What are they? What are they? What are they calling it on paper? The, the, in the press the, release. The, the Chips Act is chips obviously Act. a strategic move to bolster, you know, U.S. manufacturing uh, capability and supply of advanced chips. But it's very clearly a subsidy uh, for 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 Intel. But you know, in fairness, it's it's they're giving they're spreading spreading money around. Samsung's okay. getting money, and would you and call it a handout? ESM. But I call it a handout. I mean, yeah, it is a handout. It's taxpayer <laughs> handout. But I mean, I don't think it's the wrong thing to do. By the way, you know, but I, I will say Look, this: it's not, a, it's not an entitlement. It's it's a, it's an in, it's an it's an investment. But, but, I mean, but, handout, but, investment, whatever you want to call it. And they have to produce. And the, your question is a good one: Can they even deliver? But I'll say this, John: fifty-two billion. Uh, for, to me, fifty billion is a drop in the bucket. You know, you, you hear numbers like you know, trillions of dollars thrown around. The likes of Google, Amazon, Apple, who are all, you know, big, big meta, big, big players in this game, big, big consumers of chips. You know, we're, we're talking, they're trying to build, we heard this at Broadcom, million GPU clusters. Okay, these are big, big consumers of chips. They also make their own chips. All three of the big hyperscalers do. And so and they have so much money on their balance sheet. They could easily write a $100 billion check to bolster uh, U.S.-based manufacturing. They could. And I think the smart thing for the U.S. government to do would be, look, we're going to dial down all the rhetoric around like, not letting you buy, you know, iRobot. Um, well, let's, and, get into, let's get into and, iRobot. And, and, and where, let, me just, let, me, let me just finish that thought. And you know what? But you guys got to step up and start writing some checks for U.S. competitiveness in the semiconductor business. So let's start figuring out a, a way to do that that is additive you know, long-term to their balance sheets and at the same time additive to U.S. competitive and doesn't necessarily take taxpayer dollars. They've got they've got so much money, they don't know what to do with it. So they're buying GPUs. Anyway, yeah, well, we'll, yeah Jassy. We'll, 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 was, we'll, get it, we'll get into the GPU architecture later with Google Next conversation because they have a, they had a lot that they announced. Let's get into Andy Jassy and Amazon and Amazon Web Services. First, Andy Jassy had a couple of things happen this week. One, he had the shareholder letter that went out. And then um, he was on CNBC for an interview, and he was very vocal. And by the way, I give him amazing props for what he did. That takes leadership, and that takes guts, okay? And it was ironic at Google, the new head of public sector, and first within the first couple of minutes of the interview, she brought up China directly, volunteered it. We are not doing business in China. This is from the CEO of Google Public Sector. And by the way, has Kevin Mandian on her board. So I've learned a lot of new things. We'll get that in a second, but... This China rhetoric is huge. Andy Jassy basically said, and my this is my takeaway. He basically said to the world, look it, we tried to buy a company. We thought there was synergies and it got rejected in the EU and the, and the US told us they would reject it too. And as a, because two Chinese companies were the competitors and they were worried about us having unfair business practices. Meanwhile, in order to do the product that they make, you have to have data on everyone's home, right? And so you don't trust an American company uh, you'll, but yet you'll trust these Chinese companies. And he was bit blatant. That's when he said abuse of the law. Yeah. So okay, that was so, massive. And and I think that's leadership. If people are throwing haymakers at him. That's hypocritical Amazon. Cause always the haters of Amazon, but, but he's stepped up. Oh, that, no, that was hundred awesome. percent, John. I, I gotta, I gotta add to that. So basically let me double click on it. 
so the the right they blocked the irobot acquisition and so andy's point was when you have these chinese manufacturers these home vacuum cleaners they have to map out your home right yeah. they have they're collecting all the data on your home and, and you're trusting them and yet at the same time you don't trust us and you're blocking this acquisition it's it's really absurd. And then he did make the statement that they're overstepping their bounds and they're probably probably not following the law. I, I hope I hope they challenge that in court. The problem is this the current sentiment with in this administration is to just pretty much block everything, which is is to me, it's just swung too far. So so that the other thing I would add, I put out a tweet on this. Andy Jesse did exactly what we said he was gonna do. With Amazon, everybody was people were calling for his head last in 2022. You remember? Oh, how long is Jassy going to last here? We were like, wait a minute, the guy just took over. You know, it, he took over, and the, the the market was booming, so they had to hire people like crazy during COVID. You couldn't even get toilet paper, so they had to like figure out the supply chain, hire people like it. So they, of course they overhired, and then interest Ukraine hits, interest rates start going up, the Fed starts tightening like overnight. So you know, you just can't just turn around the steamship, but what they did was remarkable. The stock's at an all-time high today. They've got liquidity in the balance sheet. AWS is kicking ass, even though you read Charles Charles Fitzgerald, you think they're about to go under. Fitzy's like out of control with his vitriol against anything that's not Microsoft, but he's he's funny as hell. But at any rate, uh, Jesse did exactly what we said he was going to do. He was going to cut costs, naturally. He was going to make sure that the retail business started – cranking again. He's doing media deals. Thursday night football is a huge win for those guys. He's got advertising revenue kicking in. He's taking over AI, basically helping Adam, you know, figure that out because it's so important. And, and he, Amazon is, you know, is, is, is back with enormous runway. So kudos to him. Great leadership. Everything we thought he would do and more, John. Yeah. Well, I like the fact that he stood tall and he said, well, it was on everyone's mind. And and he's uh, obviously listening to the podcast because he basically said what we've been saying in so many words. But he he did it in a way that was very um, respectful. He was very op opinionated, but he brought up the entrepreneurial equation. And and to me, what resonates in that his little diatribe with the New York Times reporter or CBC reporter is he he used an example. He says, "Look, we're just that's not our model to go do people." try to screw people over. I saw also sell more stuff. And yeah, we offer third party. But his real point was iRobot suffered. They didn't make it. They weren't going to make it. You had Chinese competition. That's, that's, we know in China, there's no entrepreneurial action. It's all controlled by the government. It's all, the whole system works as one. The state runs everything. So you have two companies that are scaling up and using all their anti-capitalism to have a competitive advantage over the American company. And so, so he basically saying, this is an entrepreneurial success story. They started a company, created so much value, and then had competition. And Amazon synergies would have put them into, into more competitive synergies on leverage, on scale, and supplier components, et cetera. And then they reject it. The company lays off a third of its staff, stock price tanks. It essentially goes into a tailspin. And Dave, you know, we always say in the queue, when the boat starts taking on water, it's hard to to, to really make it work. And sometimes it's ir ir irrecoverable. You can't recover from a, a uh, that when the boat starts sinking or the plane starts starts going to a tailspin. So that that was really the problem. And, and that bothers me because I think that's the government that is saying we would rather see entrepreneurship fail over some hypothetical scenario of a company's intentions. Okay, that I have a problem with right, right there. So I think, you know, Jassy standing up for all the entrepreneurs out there and people who start businesses. It's hard to start a business, hard to run a business. And, okay. and, and, you know, yeah. Did they do anything wrong? Nothing wrong. It was a good deal. So, <laughs> it's a, and it's the, it's but, the China angle. And that's the whole point. The U S government is so clueless on this but and, to, and the regulators to, to your point. It's like the, it's like the tale of the parable of the Chinese farmer. You know, that where he, his horse runs away and they say, oh, sorry, he goes, oh, maybe then a horse brings, brings back, comes back with seven other horses. Yeah, that's great. He goes, oh, maybe. And then the son breaks his arm. Oh, that's terrible. And then this, you know, you've, you've heard that parable, right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. And But the point is there are these unintended consequences of these decisions that it's really hard to predict. And so, the, okay, great. So you hurt an American company 
you're essentially helping these Chinese companies with your public policy. Is that the, the outcome that you're intending? Really? And so I just, I feel like it's really hard for the government to predict their, the, the impact of their actions. Uh, and, and, you know, who knows, John, maybe AI will be smarter than the government soon and they'll be able to figure it out. I, I, I'm really disappointed in the public private partnership and the discontinuities between, on the one hand, we want to be more competitive and you hear, you hear things like, you know, tariffs against China. And the other hand, we're just constricting business, trying to do regulatory capture in certain industries, which doesn't really work out that well. But yeah, to back to Jassy, he he was stellar. And I thought I gotta I have to say, I thought Andrew Ross Sorkin was was excellent. I thought he did a really, really good job. He, in the he, does, he does he does good interviews. He consistently asks the right questions. He obviously does his homework, which is which is awesome. But you know, the Lena Khan at the FTC is the problem is is that, you know, in 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 the AI conversations, not to bring back into AI, because like I said on the cube, we're AI drug these days. Everything's about gender AI. We have an, uh, an era where there's massive societal change going on and shift. And lean, people like Lena Khan, who's at the F FTC, really is not plugged into what's going on in the world. And because technology is not this evil section of people or section of, of, of industry where there's evil people trying to screw people over. It's just, it's becoming pervasive in everything we do. So the number one conversation with Genevieve is societal change. Better government, be a better government, be a better... Uh, uh, provide to your to citizens better services to, to streamlining antiquated systems to the public sector to offering on, uh, entrepreneurship opportunities and also democratization dave you know ai is a uh, is a technology that will if handled properly and not regulated and killed by narrow-minded people like lena khan is to say hey you know People can level up. You know, you can have a, someone with a degree in Harvard and someone who never went to college can level up within months and be peers. Okay, we're talking about the biggest democratization opportunity in our, in our history. So, the whole idea of you know underrepresented minorities getting a fair shot, getting access, these are things that we work on. The opportunity is now for that, and I think you know the, the stuff's changing so fast that. You're having some pedigree or having some status, elite status or privilege is could be at risk tomorrow <laughs> because the opportunities are everywhere and the and the ability to capture those opportunities is available. And the skills to do it are 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 the same for any people. So th so to me, that's a big problem. And so my rant is is that the, that the regulation of AI, the 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 other side of the coin of safety is what opportunity costs are being blown by uh, trying to regulate something that's that's not well known? You don't know the outcome. You can't make op optimal decisions. It's like a startup. It's always hard, and you got to keep iterating with the decisions. You can't figure out unknowns that are so, evolving. So uh, uh, um, I think the problem I have, with, the biggest problem I have with Lena Khan is she's she's trying to rewrite the law through her public policy, at least how I interpret the law, um, the history of, 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 of the DOJ and, and the FTC meddling in tech is frankly very poor. That markets generally moderate the technology monopolies and market forces have done a much better job in my opinion than the government. Now, having said that, if a monopoly is colluding or they're bundling, or they have practices that hurt, hurt consumers, that's breaking the law. But essentially what she's doing is saying, if there's a potential for those things, we are going to declare monopoly and then we're gonna take action. So there's a big difference between these things are actually happening and they have the potential to happen. And I think that she's conflating them. And I think that's where Jassy is right, that she's overstepping her legal boundaries and it's, you know, to me, it's very disappointing. All right. Well, let's get into uh, while we have Andy Jassy on the docket here. And uh, by the way, we should ping him and get him on the podcast. Um, I'm going to reach out to him and see if he comes on and, and kind of have a, a Elon Musk moment for us, how he made Joe. Remember Joe Rogan and had Elon Musk on and yeah. everyone went crazy. So we should try to see if we can lure Andy on to do us a favor and come on and share his thoughts. Um, let's get into his dear, dear shareholder letter. They had the annual letter. It's a tradition that Jeff Bezos started. Now that Andy's the CEO, took it over. Um, you read it. What'd you think? Um, things jumped out of, obviously the numbers are incredible. Um, 
but they overspent right. in the pandemic. He he told me that in, uh, when I last time I met with him in November with went to a hockey game, and I, he said, "Yeah, we we spent a lot. We built up. We didn't know it was going to end." So, well, but plus they plus they were responding to customer demand. I mean, what are they going to do? Not respond? I, I mean, he was it, it, look at his share of the letter was really upbeat versus well, the last year, which was you know, hey, we got some challenges and we're going to take them on. He basically did everything he said he's going to do and more. Um, you know, to me, it's just it was they're, it was they're, upbeat. they people saying they're cutting back though. That's the, my point. My point is is that he they got to cut back. They have to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that. You know, people are always going to complain at, at those things. I mean, they've cut back in AWS, cutting back on capex, which of course you know Charles Pitts is like, oh, see, they're in trouble. Um, I, I think well, you, you know, over, to me, if you overspend yeah. though, if you overspend, Dave, then you know it's like right. You got to claw it back. <laughs> so, so to to me, just the just I'll just briefly the combination yeah. of what's happening at AWS or Amazon, you know, retail, uh, and AWS. You know, coming into play now. AWS has its own challenges that we should talk about that, but their businesses are are humming, and that's why the stock's at an all time high again. Which we were saying when the stock was getting beat up, and everyone was like, "Oh wow, Amazon's done. Hmm, could be a buying opportunity." Again, we don't advise stocks. Be careful. Do your own research. We're not a, a you know stock advisors, uh, but you know we do watch companies and we watch fundamentals and we know good management when we see it. Um, the one thing I would say. So AWS, I, I think it would be really interesting to see if they can accelerate growth uh, as a result of AI. We should talk about their AI strategy. He did say, he, he said now a number of times, and he said in his letter that cost optimization is attenuating, has attenuated. That doesn't mean it's gone away. And I, I tweeted out some data. Cost optimization, it's like muscle memory in golf. You know, you hit that shot, you know, I don't really know that well, but you know, when you hit that shot, you're like, oh, okay, I got this down now. And you, and it becomes like your best shot, your go-to shot with your seven iron. You can always hit it. Like I've seen you hit it. Boom. I'm like, you can't miss. It's unbelievable. So you got that muscle memory. Well, I think that's what cost optimization is like now. They, the IT buyers and Amazon customers, cloud customers, they have muscle memory on cost optimization. They say, hey, we know how to do this. Let's do that. Now, a lot of people think, oh, that's bad for the cloud companies. It's not bad, here's why. What they do is then they save money. It, this market's always been elastic. I've just never had the data on cloud, but now I do and I'm seeing it. When prices go down, when cost goes down on something that's valuable like technology, that's that's it, it, they spend more. And that's what happens. They'll invest more and they'll invest more for innovation. So when I've seen this for years with storage, cost per bit yeah. would go down, people would buy more. <laughs> Why? Because we can store more. We can do more data and analytics on that. It's the same things happening with cloud resources. You're going to see the same thing happen with with GPUs. Uh, the costs go down. People will consume more. Now, is it a straight line up? No. It goes in step functions and it goes up and down. It's not always a pretty straight line. That's how markets work. And so, he did call that out. But I think that there is a gain sharing going on with that muscle memory, meaning people are taking money from their savings and they're putting it into AI and they're also taking it from other places and putting it in AI. That's clearly what the data shows. Yeah, I agree. And one of the, yeah, for me, what jumped out at this, this letter was, it was a very long letter. It's on, it's on their website. Um, they, they've been cutting back, but their delivery times are up. They're always, that's a big deal for Amazon is delivery times. Um, the, the, the emphasis on prime again, with the original content is core. The, you mentioned Thursday night football. They got programs. They had that successful, um, Boys in the Boat movie that was phenomenal. Just just hit that should that should win awards. I thought that was a phenomenal movie. But their advertising business, Dave, Dave is growing. So yeah. you, you don't think about Amazon as an advertising company. So what you're going to see is, I think their whole TV offering is going to be disruptive. So let's keep an eye on that. I remember I had a one on one with Andy Jassy uh, for a pre reinvent briefing, and um, he's like, "Why do you love Twitch so much?" I'm like, "Well, first of all, Twitch is huge. It's fun." It's gamers, but the numbers are massive. And then, you know, that was the beginning. They started getting into the, now they got free V they got over the, they got the, over the top. So you watch their free media. And remember they bought MGM. So MGM originals, all that stuff. Uh, AWS, we cover that like a blanket. So no need to go in there. The key, the key is going to be there to see how their custom chips, will they have a lead on performance and will they drive that home? But I'm really fascinated by that video prime video service. Yeah. That, that really got my attention. So, you know, advertising and prime 
they're in the entertainment business, right? And, and they went out the whole the vision talking about primitives and primitive services, and then the map that was out. interesting. Yeah, that, the primitives conversation. So he applied that to Amazon.com. I found that really because we've been talking about primitives in the cloud forever for a decade, and we and we, we used to say, Andy, why, you know, why don't you guys do more solutions? And, and he remember on the cube, and he said to us, look, guys, here's why it gives us optionality and flexibility to move fast. And he was talking about primitives in the in the, in the Amazon.com business. I loved that conversation. Well, you know, well, you know why they're doing it. Here's my spe first of all, this is my speculation. No one told me this. I'm just my connecting the dots. Um, it's an Amazon thing, and it's an, this is an Andy fingerprints are all over this. What he's doing here, he's cleverly tying together Amazon services so he can tee up that we have technology on Amazon. Because remember, Andy's been very vocal about, we've been doing machine learning for years. Which Now, everyone says that now, David. You notice that? So everyone's like, oh, we've been doing machine AI for years. Before, it was like all hyped up. I mean, that is- We even biggest... say that, John. We even say that. It's, I it's thought true, about AI but... once. <laughs> <laughs> I programmed in Lisp in the 80s. That was AI. Um, so, so I think he, what he's doing here is saying, look at Amazon as a company, including AWS is using AI everywhere. Then they have been using data and machine learning. So this primitives is basically saying our cloud has been serving our ex existing business for since it started. I mean, remember Amazon started, Amazon web services started with one customer, amazon.com. Okay. And they grinded their way through and iterated through and, 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 as a customer of themselves, Amazon Web Services became the behemoth that it is. So this primitives is basically saying, this is how we think about our business. And he's, I guarantee you the next step's gonna be tie that to machine learning and AI so they can go back to tell the world, hey, we are better than Microsoft and anyone else at AI. Now, Google is gonna be a good company to watch when it comes to, is Amazon's AI better than Google? Because let me just before you before you go to Google, can I just say one last thing yeah. about yeah. Lena Lena Khan? I just want to say something about Amazon. <laughs> so the I reason I I get so pissed off about this is I think about Amazon. I think I'm like a loyal Amazon customer. Somebody told me one time years ago, "You're a Prime member." I go, "Yeah, of course I'm a Prime member." They go, "Do you know that on average you spend like twenty percent more on products?" Blah blah blah. I'm like, uh, "Okay." They said, "Would you ever give up your Prime?" I'm like, no, never. My point is, I have choices. I can buy uh, uh, online from Walmart. I can buy online from a thousand different places. But I, I personally trust Amazon. I know they're going to deliver. They're going to deliver fast. They freaking deliver on Sundays. If I have a problem, they fix the problem. You know, they, they, if, if they, if I got the wrong thing or it's damaged, I send it back. They're, they like, they're great to do business with. So they're not hurting me as a consumer. I, I love the way they've, you know, helped my life. They've like, driven so much convenience to my life. So when I see like all this vitriol against Amazon, I'm like, look, then you don't have to buy from them. Buy from somebody else. Or drive to the store, whatever you want. But, you know, anyway, let's worry. talk about Google. Uh, no, no, I was segueing from, from where Google um, about the, the AI, because Microsoft, I mean, not Microsoft, Amazon, and Amazon Web Services, Amazon proper, they have done a lot of technology. So like to, to call them like falling behind is ridiculous. Now, Google has the same problem that Amazon has. They don't get credit at, in mainstream for all the work they've done. I mean, if it wasn't for Google, mostly I'd say most, almost 90% of the, the AI success is probably due to the, at the root back to the lineage. It's, it's Google people. Google and Meta's trying to take credit for now. They hired all the Google people. So, so Meta, Meta basically is a little mini Google in terms of the engineering prowess. It did, certainly didn't come from Zuckerberg. He wasn't like known for the, a great engineer. He's a great product guy and he can code P PHP, but he's not the, the killer deep tech engineer. They've been poaching Google. They live in the, it's, in the, it's a valley, a valley known, known public secret. Google DNA AI roots goes back to all the papers that were written. They've been doing it for many, many years. That's, and it's in the company, Google search and all the scale and everything they've done like Amazon. So at Google next, you saw them bring all that out. You saw Google flex. Um, and, it, and I said this many years ago, Dave on the cube, remember we, we had a big session on this. We said, if they can get their act together and go back into the back room and get all the stuff and have someone organize it and just this department, pull it from there and just get it into one coherent thing. They'd smoke everybody. Remember that conversation? It might have been like three years ago. Yeah. Um, and and when when everyone's like, why isn't Google winning? They have large scale experience. 
They know how to deal with data at massive scale. They basically invented the SRE concept and Borg, which is now Kubernetes, um, is they have all that. It's all coming from Google. So Google doesn't get enough credit, okay, in the industry. Insiders know it. In fact, there's a lot of poaching going on from Google either. People or the ideas. And half the open AI people used to work at Google or came from the DeepMind team. And it's just, it's just, that's it's the creative process of Silicon Valley. It's the fertilizer is the people and the technology. So Google's a big been a big part of that. So um, I think Google and Amazon are going to really flex their AI. I think Microsoft right now is looking good. If, if you look at the, from a leaderboard standpoint, from perception, but I'll tell you right now, the conversation I've been having with people in the trenches, startups, no one likes Azure. Okay. They like, they like Google. No one complains about, have you ever heard anyone complain about Google price? No, 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 not really ever. And I have data on this too. I want to share it with you. Yeah, please share. Cause um, I'm telling you right now, they could make a really power move right now in terms of moving faster up the leaderboard or from the third place challenge position to a leadership position. And uh, I'll tell you, they, they have the chops and they're bringing it. They're stacked right now. So I, I just want to say something about, so when Frank Slootman um, took over for Snowflake, and I think he might've written about it in his book, but he told me this, this company, Snowflake, they had product market fit. Like for years, but they, they all they had to do is figure out the go-to-market. So I came in, I scaled go-to-market. And you know, you don't want to scale go-to-market until you have product market. But when you get product market fit, you want to scale your go-to-market. Well, Google has got product market fit, but they can't figure out the go-to-market and the service model. And they've struggled with that, right? Rob Enslin was kind of running sales at Google, and now he's at UiPath. Um, and so I, I, they'll eventually figure it out. But the data that I have, Suggest that AI is really allowing them to close the gap. Not not so much broadly in cloud. All right, all right. But let's let's set, talk. Set it up. Let's, set it up let's talk us. narrowly in AI. Okay, so when you look at the ETR data, and they have a very consistent time series methodology which measures spending momentum on a platform. And spending momentum, it's only measured by percent of customers that are at doing something. So it's just a percent customer measure. It's not a actual dollar measure but it's called net score. Net score represents the net percent of customers that are spending more on a platform. So they ask a bunch of questions. Are you, you know, adding new? Are you spending more? Are you spending flat? Are you spending less? Or are you churning? And they take the lesses away from the, the mores and that's net score, okay? Mm -hmm. And anything over 40% is exceedingly good, okay? So I, I just ran before this QPod, I ran numbers and I ran it back to January of 2022 for Google, AWS, and Microsoft. And the net score in just the machine learning and AI sector, the net score for Google was 61%, AWS 60%, Microsoft 71%. That's back in January 22. Now, the other thing they measure is how many people actually respond. Because the more people that respond, it's an indicator, a proxy for install base. So Google was at the time 93, AWS is 151, Microsoft 175, okay? So all three had very high net scores, a lot of spending momentum, but, you know, relatively small ends, 93, 151, and 175 for Google, AWS, and Microsoft, respectively. Now, fast forward to April 24, the survey that just hit, okay? It's not even, not even, it's kind of quasi-public. Net scores, Google, 56%, AWS, 58%, so pretty comparable. Microsoft, 74%. But check out the, the ends, the responses. Google 340, AWS 370, Microsoft 611. So what's happening is, let me explain this. What's happening is Microsoft has stayed elevated in terms of customer percentage spending more and even actually accelerated a little bit. Their numbers of N went through the roof because of you know Azure API getting open, open API access. But Google and AWS have come together in terms of those ends. It was 93 versus 151. Now it's 340 versus 370. So you can do the math. But when you look at the data over time, and they have these graphs that, you know, they use uh, Power BI, which kind of sucks, but it doesn't. You can see these coming together. And Google, and in, in MLAI, Google and AWS really on top of each other. So that says that Google is in the AI sector really catching up uh, in terms of customer momentum and, and customer, you know, install base. So to break to simplify that in my mind, because that it's a lot of data there. I was trying to grok it. So is it 
is the gap closing? And if, if you can scope it, scope the, um, the the gap between two and three here between Amazon, how would you how would you kind of scope that? And if you can scope between one and two, that'd be great as well. Yeah. So, how, how, are we talking a, a, horse, a horse length, <laughs> um, multiple horse lengths? You, you know, horse racing. Yeah. So lengths. Thing. So 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 at, uh, if you go back to January of twenty two, mm-hmm. one fifty one over ninety three. So so there was one point six. So Google or AWS had one point six more installations in this survey than than did Google. And now, when you do the math. It's 370 and 340, so it's 1.08. So basically, you know, you're talking about 60% lead down to an 8% lead. Okay, so you know, if you're if it's a horse race, the 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 plotter at the back of the pack coming down, you know, the far turn, it, it's here comes Google on the outside. And he's <laughs> and Google's going to the whip. You know, the right-handed yeah. whip, yeah. as they say. <laughs> so they're so they're in position. They have a shot oh, of, yeah. of coming up faster than you think. That's what the data says. No question about it. And of course, Microsoft just because they're everywhere. Microsoft's. I, let me say this about the Microsoft interpreting the mic, Microsoft data in these surveys. They're so ubiquitous. They're so large, and they have so many customers. It's they just they overwhelm the survey data. Whereas. You know, Google and and AWS, it's a much more sort of apples to apples comparison. So, so given that, I would say uh, being at, at Google's event in Vegas this week, I would say that it's very clear that they they got all their app, they got all the, all the the package together. BigQuery actually now is a data platform with the vector embeds and the capability and all the multimodal reasoning is looking really like a, like a viable platform, scalable. Um, I found that was my that was my favorite little nuance point is that big query with uh, the data there is really set up well and they have tons of stuff around the analytics and databases. The uh, Gemini product is phenomenal. I actually did a little test. I said, um, <laughs> "Is Silicon Angle an influential publication?" Because you know everyone's trying to figure out who's influential. Of, of course, the analyst relations department at Google's struggling with that as well. Um, and others, and, and it really, it said, yes, they are extremely, and it, and the answer wasn't generic stuff. It was specific to our business. It was really, really good. I was blown away. Of course, I did the vanity search, you know, who's John Furrier, and then it gives you who it is, and they, they said I worked at Oracle and VMware. Um, so, so stellar career at Oracle and VMware. No, IBM and, and HP, they got it wrong there. Close, uh, big, big uh, corporate company. And then I started putting in stuff around things that I knew about in the industry and it gives you a good answer. And then it gives you reasons why evidence. Um, so that perplexity that does the same thing, which I like, and we do it with our, our, our rag system. So I think this multimodal thing is huge, Dave, this cross modality reasoning is going to be the, the real AI. And I think like our last conversation on the queue, which people loved, I thought I'd, I'd tie it here is that the, during the early days of the web, you had web pages, and you had search engines. Here in AI, you're going to have big power, highly, highly capable, smart things, mechanisms, not just a search engine, but like technology that's built by people who are really deep and deep tech engineering. And then you're going to have users of AI, like the web page. So it's very clear to me at Google is that that's happening. And the, the consulting businesses are booming as well. And what's happening there is that unlike the old IT transformation projects, the new consulting system integrators are doing coding. They're actually engineering stuff on behalf of the customers. So that is a major differentiator for the ones that have engineering talent because, you know, these the, the companies need to move fast with AI by, by board pressure. And so they're putting pressure on the on the management of, of these companies and saying, to, like, where's our AI stray? We need more growth. And they got to hire people to build it. So we saw this with the web too. Remember the old interactive shops? I'll build your web page for you. Um, very similar concepts yeah. going on here. So, you know, Google is going to be a supplier. They have all the chops. The one area that I was impressed on, but still I feel is going to be a pro- uh, an opportunity to, to keep an eye on for Google is their ecosystem. They, a lot of people were there with booth, big names, but I think they still need another year to make sure to, to validate that. So I think Google should make sure this year their focus is 100% on making sure the ecosystem doesn't fail. They yeah. have to make the ecosystem work by driving business through those partners, helping those partners, and then getting business for themselves as well. So 
if the ecosystem fails with Google Cloud, it's it, they'll never catch up to number two. They'll be, in fact, they'll fall away in, in the distant third. And so I think I think that's my takeaway. And and I think the the partnerships are good, but there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance in the air with the it, partnerships. It, it depends on the layer of the stack, right? Again, this is something else Slootman told me. Is like, you know, Google actually wasn't Slootman. I think it was Scarpelli said that that Google this that really doesn't that friendly doing business. Now that was with Snowflake because they get BigQuery and BigQuery is awesome. And it's really head to head with Snowflake. But I wanted to go back. I just got to tell you a, a quick, make you laugh for a second. Before Gemini, when it was barred, I asked, I was vanity, you know, barding and searching like who's Dave Vellante. It said that I started Silicon Angle with Jason Calcanis, <laughs> which is hilarious. So you were, you were, you had a background with Calcanis, right? You guys yeah. used to work, you know, he, kind of he was, a, he, was a, he was a producer uh, at PodTech, my podcasting company. He so, did podcasts. So maybe that's how it, it but, connected the well, dots. No, Who knows? J J he's a prolific, but, he's a prolific media person. I mean, Jason has roots, but his newsletter, he started, that's how he got in the business. And then he started Weblogs Inc., which was the original and Gadget was the first real tech blog. That right and rocked it and then so maybe it was confusing you with with calcanus but then the second thing course, i wanted to say easy, is easy easy to easy to confuse so, so i was in texas this week i was in houston saw hpe and saw fidel maruso pat osborne was down there although you can connect with them jim jackson was i went down to see him but he was busy so i just kind of waved um jason newton and guys and then but then i went to um drove over to austin and i met with the cfo of yvonne and and rob williams um and so uh and i saw michael which is kind of interesting but i also saw matt baker michael, michael dell you mean michael dell yeah yeah and i also saw matt baker and we were we were shooting the shit like we always do matt our, our favorite matt baker are you matt baker yeah yeah ai matt baker yeah, he's all Who's, over he, he's all over the whole rag stuff he loves the ai game right now he's really been digging in hard I love it. Oh my God. I love his, link, his LinkedIn posts are phenomenal. He's unbelievable. I mean, he got, cause so, so Matt Baker, for those who don't know him, he used to run um, strategic planning at Dell. And then when the whole AI thing took off, they said, okay, Matt, um, they, they hired uh, or they brought back uh, Vivek Mahindra to take Matt's job on strategic planning. And he said, Matt, you go figure out AI. So now he's like charging ahead with AI. And every time you meet him, he's like, like I think the last time I saw him was November and we were talking. And then since then, you know, he's goes out and does all this research. He's doing a bunch of internal stuff. He's learned so much. Um, basically I'm in talking to the CFO of Dell, Yvonne and Rob and talking to Matt Baker and, and certainly Michael, uh, but I'm convinced that Dell, because they're like, you know, nearly a hundred billion dollar company, they're doing some really interesting stuff in AI that could put them ahead of a lot of their customers, which is rare. For Dell, right? Usually Dell's, you know, they're selling boxes and they're going into customers and the financial services guys are telling them what they need. I think the reverse is happening where, you know, Dell's learning a lot because they're investing a lot. They have such a big company. They realize, wow, if we drive AI, we're going to drop money to the bottom line. So doing a lot of cool stuff with RAG and, and, and Matt's right. It, it, we, were, we were talking about a lot of customers haven't figured out how easy RAG is to do. And, um, you know, he was pointing to us. He goes, well, you guys did rag. Of course, you were like way ahead of the curve. He was pointing to us. But he asked me a really interesting question. And I wanted to ask you, because we were talking about Google. And I'm saying, hey, how about AWS? They're going to have Olympus. And Microsoft's got open AI. And the data suggests they're running away with it, like we just talked about. He said, yeah, but, you know, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on with Llama. And you said about this when we talked about the Gen AI uh, power law. He said, don't you think that open source is going to win? That yeah, all this proprietary yes. stuff is at some point the customer is going to say, well, wait, why am I going to pay, you know, monopoly prices when I can get just as good a functionality um, for, and what's I can do mass customization with open the, source. What's the question? Don't you think open source is going to ultimately win all these closed systems and what's going to happen to these closed systems? Anthropic, uh, I, I, Olympus. Okay. So, okay, so, so this what? is a new, let me just, one more thing. It's a really interesting question I've been having mm -hmm. with leaders. Like, will these LLMs become commoditized? One school of thought says, absolutely. We talked about this last week. The other school of thought uh, says, no, they won't. So then there's that dimension. And then there's the open versus closed dimension. So piece that all together for me. 
Well, we talked about it last week on the pod about commoditization. I thought you agreed with the thesis. It's it's sometimes when people say commoditization, they they're talking about something different. So when something's commoditized, what does that mean? That means it's 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 a common thing. It's not as expensive. It's cheaper. It gets lower in value. It's everywhere. It's a commodity. Um, and then commodities change based on scarcity, right? And or about volume and what's what abundance there is, demand supply. Uh, so I think with LLMs, these foundation models, that world is growing and changing so fast that it's it, the commoditization is not really the question because there's so much growth and value in these models they're, that they're changing. So the question is to ask is what's the who's more obsolete? What's who's obsolete? Who's not? Who's better? If someone's not good at their LLM, they're not going to do business or they all they'll have a bad experience. I think our power law and research that we put out where you have that power law and at the top of the power law and volume size of model is definitely where the big players are. And they're, they're called, we call them proprietary. That's the original name for them. Some call them pioneering models, but they don't, they don't, they don't like the word proprietary because open has AI is open in their name. So like, they don't want to be labeled as proprietary because that's pejorative. It means Sam Altman said he wish he didn't take that name. Did you I hear know, him say that? No, that I never. Funny. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> he said in retrospect, I wish we didn't call ourselves open well, AI. Well, Basically well, saying we're not open. I know. Well, of course, everyone knows that, but that's the whole point. That's just optics. That's just that's like yeah. That's just like in the in our in in computer industry, being proprietary means you're you're owning it. You don't want anyone else to get it. And you don't. You just you're selfish. And open source software is open. So open. Then the question that, he, um, that Matt's asking is, will open source win or will open win? Open always will win. In our we are we are like it's like it's like um um. Maybe I shouldn't say this. It's like <laughs> it's like it's like the it's like the right to choose. Okay, you know that debate that goes on. So right, you know, women's right to choose. You know, we we are in we you can't put that back the way it was. It's has to. It's never going to change. I think so. I think that that discussion is a pretty political one. It's happened in our business. It's become political. Proprietary is bad. Okay, open is better. Open will always win. You can be proprietary, and the norm, the normalcy of private uh, proprietary is I own it, land. It's proprietary. You have a deed on your house, right? You have land. You own it, right? That's proprietary yeah. to you. That's not a bad thing. That's just called ownership. So ownership of something is bad. So the word proprietary means I built it. I own it. Uh, means no one else can co-own it. You could use it and I charge you a fee for it. That's not open source software. So that's where the proprietary name got associated because it was the default conversation. OpenAI built their own model. They own it. They spend millions and millions of dollars to do that. Um, and, and that's that. Where Matt Baker's getting at is that open source models are getting just as much traction and, and functionality and ad adoption as those proprietary funded for business companies, which means it's not as expensive and it's open. So that's a good thing. So that is going to put pressure on the big guys that have spent all that money to do one of two things. Make it commodity in the sense of, okay, it's commodity. Use it. It's not as good as everyone else. It's got hallucinations. And I'll make as much money as I can until it dies. It's a race to the bottom. Or they could say, let's pour more money into it as a proprietary business and make it better. And that's what they have to do. So we, when we were talking about it, I said, if anyone's going to be commoditized, it's going to be the big LLMs. That was my answer. Matt Wood agreed he on, on LinkedIn. He pinged me. So the big guys are going to be proprietary because as you go down the power law, the smaller models actually are around people's data. And that's proprietary. And that's not bad. That's a good thing because I own my thing. Now, open source software is going to adopt open models that can be programmed with. So that's kind of the way I see it. And I think what Matt Baker's smart about is, is that he knows that staying open will give them the best price performance because open source tends to be free. Now, what will happen with these open source models, just like an open source, a company will form around it to support it, to provide what Red Hat did. So, you know, we used to ask, is there a Red Hat for the cloud? What was that? Uh, we would always say, is there a Red Hat for, um, for big data? For big data. Well, yeah. guess what? There could be one coming soon. I think that was a no a decade ago. But there could be a red hat for AI in the sense of if open source continues to get more popular, if you look at Hugging Face, look at the leaderboards, you know, Mistral, Llama, all the open source models are doing great. Why? Because there's a huge appetite demand for them, Dave. So if anything, that's, I guess that's commodity because it's free. Well, I think, <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, open source but I think, 
<laughs> but, but, but I think to your point, as long as there's inno innovation, there's probably not going to be commoditization. I think Matt's other point was, look, it's all, it's going to be, it's about mass customization and open source is going to support that mass customization, you know, at massive scale. Um, so I, I don't know. It's an well, interesting. Well, let me ask you a question because you you know you 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 know because I saw some of these fake analysts out there you know talking about you know, stuff that they're paying customers. Um, you know, one of them said Nvidia is a monopoly, or is it a mop? Is not a monopoly. Oh, I was going to say yeah, let me, uh, let yeah. Me find Nvidia, that tweet. Let me find Nvidia is a monopoly. Nvidia is, a, is a, of course Nvidia is a monopoly. I mean, the question with Nvidia is not whether or not it's a monopoly. It is. I mean, it's got. Where, where else are you going to get? A, a GPU, the class of what they make. You know, you saw Intel trying to do, you know, Gaudi and doing some benchmarks against NVIDIA's previous generation, but Blackwell's do you, not do out you yet, think? But, do you think NVIDIA's a monopoly? Yes, of course. I, 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 yes, absolutely. I mean, they've got, you know, over probably 80% share of the high-end GPU market, maybe it was closer to 100%. They've got complete pricing power. They've got 77% gross margins. They've got a one-year backlog uh, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't write a check to them for 10 million bucks, they're not even going to return your phone calls. You're never going to see a GPU. So that that's a monopoly. <laughs> so the question is, are they going to keep their monopoly and how are they going to keep their monopoly? How long is it? I saw this consortium that's getting together that said they'd have sort of um, CUDA equivalent functionality by the end of the year. I'm like, well, wait a minute. CUDA was, was, was first shipped like more than 15 years ago. You're not going to compress 15 years into one year. Now, maybe they can, you know, more narrowly apply it and compete. I mean, the whole industry wants competition for NVIDIA. I want to see competition for NVIDIA. But, you know, their packaging, the Mellanox move that they made years ago, it's going to take a long time for people to un unseat that. We know we we sat through Charlie Cowis's presentation at Broadcom. We know what their strategy is with Ultra Ethernet. Um, and where they're winning with, you know, connectivity. Uh, but it's going to take a long time for the XPU folks to catch up, in my opinion, to NVIDIA. I, I think they will have a monopoly for at least in this market for at least five years. It could be longer. It could well, be a 10-year monopoly. It, I just find it's embarrassing that analysts who get paid by Intel and the other companies saying it's not a monopoly because they want to give hope, I guess, to the- Is that uh, why they say it? Because they're, they're trying to help why, Intel? Why, well, they're either yeah. incompetent or, or they're being paid or both. So so look at, but that's the- but That's why Intel doesn't invite me to their, as a Pat Gelsinger, I love Pat Gelsinger. We know each other. We've always had great interviews. We've had debates and arguments. No, in, you think that's why they don't invite me to their stuff? Because I'm- We've been so like right I, and critical of- I don't, I don't think their, I don't think they know you exist. You gotta go knock on their door. I mean, they're closed for business. Oh, yeah. Intel yes, Intel's closed for business. They're what do you mean? The ball. Well, when you don't want when you don't when you don't have anything, you close the doors and you put window dressing around it, right? So so if they're not inviting you to their analyst meeting, they don't want you in the kingdom because you're gonna probably discover stuff that's bad, right? So that's you know, independent analysts do that, right? So um they are or they think you're already brief, they don't want to waste a seat. Get someone else that's not up to speed, they want to train someone else. Um, or they just not competent. I don't know. There's a variety of reasons for that, but we're clearly covering it. You're covering it. So, you know, the reason why is that most people don't do things because they're either have dogma or some other religion around how they do things, or they don't want smart people in, in their camp. Okay. And, you know, I remember having this conversation with top Amazon people years ago. They're like, Hey, you guys are, we want to work with you because you know the most, and we want you to understand our story so that, if, you know, all these people throwing haymakers on the internet, you can at least be objective and tell the truth when it's time to like step up and say, no, no, it's not true. Because when companies have conjecture and make statements and hire people to be a mouthpiece for that conjecture, okay, that, and they're in the media, then what happens is customers will, will think that's real or not real. And then, then there's a credibility gap there. But if a company says they do X and customers think that's not true, then you don't want the analysts that talk to customers in the media saying, wait, you're lying. <laughs> it's like, wrong. What you're saying doesn't match what customers know or think about what you do. Or worse, if the third-party data doesn't back it up. So I found that the, when you have strict command and control PR, AR teams, the ones that aren't talking mean something's wrong. And that's classic hmm. marketing, Dave. You don't, you don't market when you're not good. And, and that's what's in, going on, I think, at Intel. They're 
they're not doing well. And they're licking their wounds. They had a big loss. You know, you know, like I said this last week. And companies that are trying, they don't want to amplify bad performance. Yeah, well, there's plenty yeah. of data out there on Intel. It's easy. I mean, I watch the the, the the keynotes and the presentations. And, you know, we uh, work with Floor. Floor and I are doing a breaking analysis soon on, uh, you know, yeah. just doing one of our semiconductor updates. And we'll address this. I, I mean, personally, I mean, I, I'm not going to chase Intel, but I'll chase NVIDIA. I want to spend well, I mean, more time I, with, my, my with, with My philosophy NVIDIA. is that they probably don't want to, shouldn't invite you because you're already briefed. Yeah, that, that's, you're that's already probably, on top, you're already maybe. On top of the, you're already on top of it, you know? So maybe they feel they don't need to educate you. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, could be. Look, I, don't I don't want to get into, I don't want to get into that now because, you know, there's so much that this whole analyst uh, ranking stuff has, has been a real black eye for the industry. Um, and uh, what know, do you mean? What do you mean? The, you mean those sites that rank? Yeah, I had a conversation with the I CEO see. of AR Insights just yesterday morning with a, a bunch of other analyst firms. And I was saying, hey, I see a lot of bad behavior, people using rankings and gaming the rankings so they can put that into their contracts. Um, and so it's that's not how the industry works. So you know, it's, just, it's not being monitored. It's an, it's an honor system in the industry analyst world. You know that more than anyone. You're you're an, you've been an analyst all your career. I'm just new to him. Like that, you know, this is weird. That's, that's not, that guy's not number. That guy's not number one in his analyst relations. He's not number two. Oh my I God, didn't even number. know what this thing was until somebody mentioned it to me, and I was like, oh, "Am I on there?" And I because I write, I write like I drop research every week, and so I emailed those people. I said, "Hey, do you count my stuff as a blog or as a research?" And they said. A blog, and I'm like, well, what's the difference? And I'm like, look at what no, I write. It's like no, data, no. it's survey work, it's analytics. Look and they're it. like, well, this is research. I was like, okay, well, you should count as research. All of a sudden, I hit the list. I don't know. No, if I tweet more, I'm on it. No, no the, these <laughs> lists started as remember, remember, remember the clout ranking. Yeah, yeah, clout <laughs> ranking was a joke. Was it, was it, was, that was good at first. Then it'd be like, oh, number of followers and make make your reach. I'll just buy more followers. Well, that's what I'm buy, saying. You could you just know, like, game it. You could easily <laughs> game it. Yeah. So, but a lot of these lists start as promotional uh, elements. So the the this AR Insights company has a business model to service analyst relations departments. So what they do is they have software that they sell and service their core business to analyst relations departments meaning helping them with things like organizing news and having like a SaaS service. It's actually a good business model. I actually like it. Yeah. I think, I think it's important for the industry mm -hmm. and but the leaderboard came in as more of a way of a, like a list. Here's some top analysts you could work with. So it ended up being a list of the people who are the best, best for get, getting paid, who will pay to get work. So if I'm a, if I'm looking for someone to build a deck on my house, I got the yellow page. Like, who's the best, cheapest deck builder for me? That's high, highest quality for me. And that's what this list is. It became a list of people who are mar mar who I can hire to market. And I can pay them for services, not who's the best analyst. It's who's the best at get, taking cash and doing whatever I want. That's what it is. So I told them that list is hurting their reputation. That they should kill the list or recreate the list and recategorize it, and look mm -hmm. at real research. And then they, they then they then they said something funny. You'll get a kick out of this. They said, uh, and it was a legit comment because the old it was an old school kind of mentality. Well, the the media citations are critical. I go, okay, so if I put my name on every Silicon Angle blog post, would I? How, we are media. Well, well, well. Also, how many times they're on TV? Well, we are TV. <laughs> so, so, so the, you know, clearly the the metrics are not there to do these lists, Dave. So yeah. there's no data. And so what turned out as a marketing opportunity for this good company, AR Insights, um, actually made the list more like PR Insights. Who will get paid to do public relations for you? So I think they're going to fix it. The CEO was very seemed um, very cool. Um, their um, community person's really, really nice. I really liked her. She's really friendly and very smart. Um, and they're listening. And I got to give them a lot of props. They listened. And they're going to make changes. So AR Insights is going to make changes to their algorithm or maybe even discontinue the list. I told them they should do like what Net Promoter Score does, do surveys. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't really understand this stuff. I was just looking at the list and I was like, yeah, some good analysts on there. But I, I don't know. I don't know how it works. I don't really care. I just, well, I mean, I, I want to keep doing I mean, good work and serving I our I audience. I, 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 I won't, I won't name names, but the, uh, being exposed in our area of the industry, I, I've we've been third, 14 years going to events and being involved in all the analyst relations programs out there and PR with the cube. We see all the analysts every day. And I can tell you, I, I personally can spot the, the difference between a good analyst and a bad analyst out of the box. And then over time you say consistently, you see the winners, like, you know, who the players are. It's like people who put on a good game on the field. 
it's like sports you know you can see the athletes you can see what they do and you're like wow that person looks good coming out of the tunnel but doesn't do well on the field right that's you know, obvious and so um again i i think the industry's going through a lot of change media and media in general dave is going through a lot of change and i'll tell you right now what what's going on with the cube and silicon angle is really exciting because as we get more tv and the ai clips coming out and as we get these events um more blanket coverage with team coverage the performance of the engagement is off the charts and the content coverage is phenomenal like google next just as an example i know you were traveling some of these uh, these uh, nda meetings um in the industry but i'll tell you we had great production we had great storytelling we had great news news analysis we had great news writing rob and his team we had 10 stories on our on our site before we i even did one interview after the keynote 10 and then i think we had now over 30 to 40 different stories on there and more is coming we're going to have over 500 clips when you get the right team and focus on these events it's really amazing how in real time the ability to acquire the ability to program and distribute the content with with digital is phenomenal and and the combination of our multimodal capabilities with silicon angle the cube and cube research and the platform is really coming together i got to tell you it's so exciting to see because it's like it's like watching performances go up multimodal is the hottest thing in ai right now and we just got lucky that we do multi multimodal media programming so i got to tell you it's super exciting for me and looking at this cuz we we think about this for years right we're like oh, hey we should do more videos you know we should do more research pull it all together build a platform well guess what we did google we did and google <laughs> and google now has tools for everyone else to do it too so and it's going to make us and everyone stronger so i think we're in a, you're going to see a whole new media landscape um i think this whole digital subscriptions will continue like the information does great work i see those reporters they're phenomenal but that's not the only going to be the only game in town i think you're going to see a mix of new monetization models kick in on scale high quality truth telling storytelling news analysis getting people featured personal stories um customer case studies i mean customer case studies would was 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 always viewed as a um in in media as eh it's not really news but on digital when you feature a customer success story and you tie it with news it flies around it it really distributes because the people are involved in it you got the person who's the customer they're seeing story about their environment you got the people who deliver the solution and make the products involved so social networks allow you to bring this neural vibe to the table this network effect that has people involved who amplify their own stories so the good content spreads around so what if we should what if we should talk about that this that our business and how it's changing on one of the cube pods you know rafi Meyer, Meyer, Meyerson, rafael Meyerson? he you know him you know him if you saw him uh, he pinged me and said, you know, I would like to learn. I, I listened to the cute part. I like it. I'd like to learn more about how you and John got started, how you see the business evolving, what your business is like, That's, changes yeah. in the business. I mean, you have that. a lot of good perspectives. I, I'd like to. I think I think people might dig some of that, you know, inside baseball, you yeah. know. But uh, anyway. I think, I think, well, first of all, yeah, definitely. Because one, it is, I think the it's good to know what the origination story is. But I tell you right now. It's it's not just telling the story. People want to know what we're doing because they want to work with us. We haven't been really good about marketing it. So, um, what and we, well, my big walk away again these past this year and these events and especially Google Next is that we actually have more capabilities for to get paid than we thought. So customers value certain elements of our business model. So uh, what's exciting is is that you're going to start to see we'll see new some new, new stuff come out and that's going to be fun to talk about. But again, the most important thing is how to get the content out and scale content that's quality that hits the mark where the demand is google next you search google next silicon angle the cube you'll see all the stories it's awesome and you know, guess what it's all important because it's not just it's not google saying right about it because google's having an event it's like covering the game they're making moves on stage <laughs> you got to cover the touchdowns Dave. you know you know if they make making good plays the commentary is easy when it's happening right in front of you so to me Again, I think media is changing, and, and more importantly, the, the ability to make money to fund better talent is coming into clear view, and um, it's, it's going to be fun to, to see how this all plays out. So again, I'm just super psyched. And yeah, and again, what we did with the, the Cube this week, we did another first. I did a live remote hit to New York Stock Exchange TV at lunch on day three of Google Next and did a event roundup. So if you go to NYSE on Google, you'll see April 12th. 
the Friday edition, my segment was aired. Actually, it wasn't a live hit. It was pre-recorded that went live in their program. And it was essentially um, at the end of the segment where they go, let's go to John Furrier for um, what's going on Google Next, a really big player in the cloud business. And they asked great questions. You know, Trinity, their host, was like, are they catching up? And I, you know, just really easy to do. And then did the interview because it was short. And then I went back to the, doing more Cuban interviews. <laughs> that awesome. Was awesome. Yeah, it's all good. That's great. Well, and we got, uh, uh, let's see, next week we're at SAS, right? In Vegas. You and I, we'd be together. That's yeah. ironic. We, we, we didn't do we didn't do Google Next together. We'll do it. We'll do SaaS next week. Be awesome. Well, well, we'll have to get the numbers. I'll put the publish the numbers from Google Next. Well, Dave, great uh, great pod uh, again. A lot of energy lost this week. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm burnt out right now. I had uh, you guys did a great job, in. John. Congratulations. I mean, what, what an awesome team. You, Savannah, yeah. Rob, Rebecca, Dustin. You guys were terrific. I, I was. I felt like I was there. I was able to catch up on all the news. I'd watch at night after I got back and it was, uh, it was, it was great just, job. Well, everyone just did a good, an amazing job. And you know, and Google was leaning in. So, and, and what's great about these events when, when Google brings talent to the set, brings us access to the execs, it's awesome. Um, and these were execs that had something to say. It wasn't just scripted talking points, Dave. So that was really good. And two, we have a lot of friends at Google now. And you've got to remember Kubernetes is 10 years old. And we've been covering Google as an industry. We know people from Silicon Valley, but more important, that Kubernetes team and the, the Google management team, this is a big part of their cloud strategy, right? And so it's fun to see people that we've been kind of, you know, uh, on a journey with over the past decade have position power to make build build Google Cloud. But also we know them. <laughs> we knew them before they were famous. <laughs> so it's great to see them successful and they, they're they happy for us too. So again, I, I was pretty pumped. So it's a very similar vibe to AWS from, from when we, around 2015, 2016 vibe with Amazon Web Services. Remember we that feeling where they became, we knew them before they were super popular, all the management team and the people building it out. And then it became like really popular and everyone wanted a piece of them. And we were just one of the team members. We're like a team member. Uh, it felt good. The similar type of thing happening at Google, but all right, more of that later. And then next time we'll get some, we'll try to get Andy Jassy on. I'm going to hit him up, see what, if he comes on. Be great. Love to have Andy. Dave, on. have a great weekend. Thanks, and, John. Uh, if you're listening, Hey, if you like us, give us, drop us a note on LinkedIn or Twitter, go to siliconangle.com. That that's where the, all the traffic is. Cube.net is where all the videos are stored. What's where the events going to be uh, and some goodies there, our cube alumni database and a lot more stuff. And of course the cubeai.com, check it out. That's our language model, proprietary language model. You can say it's our rag, <laughs> our, our retrieval augmentation generation. Say that 10 times. <laughs> all right, Dave, see you later. All right, John, later. thanks. See you. Bye.